Hi everyone, um, thanks for listening in to tonight's webinar. My name is Kate McCarthy and I'm a Livestock Officer with Northwest Local Land Services and tonight we're going to be talking about maintaining production in the cattle industry regardless of the season with Jeff House and he's um, the consultant or his business is Jeff House Livestock. So we thought it was a bit of a, it was timely to start to have the conversation around the I guess the cattle industry and, and some of the things that we've pulled out of the drought, some of the lessons that we've pulled out of the drought and how we can, I suppose, utilise them moving forward. So there's plenty of things such as confinement feeding and, and Jeff will touch on them a bit further. But there's plenty of things that we've sort of picked up over the past couple of seasons, I guess, that we can still continue to utilise even though some, you know, we've had that a little bit more rain and things have started to pick up again. So um, I'd just like to mention that this webinar was funded through a, a pro, uh, I guess, the New South Wales um, government um, program, which is the um, a joint program between New South Wales DPI and local land services, um, and it's the Animal Welfare Drought Engagement Program. So, um, just go to the, and I guess as being a part of local land services. It's really important for us to continue to engage with producers across the region. And I think it's important that we still, you know, we're still providing that information and working with uh, experts in the industry to, to make sure that we're engaging and, and make, um, yeah, providing the resources to you guys. So what we do at Local Land Services is we provide information and support um, to help improve agricultural productivity and better manage natural resources. And I guess we we try we hope to support or we do support producers through yeah like um, working in the agricultural space we have various units in local land services so we have biosecurity officers we have teams in the NRM the natural resource management space we have ourselves in the agricultural um, team and we have also district veterinarians which you are probably familiar with across the region. So if any time you have any questions related to any of those areas, please feel free to contact any of our officers. So with the webinar, there's some things just to have a heads up. So you're all aware that you're on mute at the moment and you will be for the duration of the webinar. Um, with the questions, I'll leave them to the end. So any questions that you have, pop them in the question box, which you'll see on the right hand side of the, I guess the tab that you got um, with the webinar, there's a questions box. Type your question in there and I'll put all those questions together and ask them to Jeff at the end of the webinar so we've allowed enough time for that. So please put your questions down, just we'll answer them as we get closer to the end. Um, one thing that's really important and it really helps um, us continue to provide these webinars is the survey that I'll, Provide, uh, pass on to you at the end of this and I'm all, I know that surveys can be a bit of that oh no we have to do a survey at the end of this but we really appreciate your feedback and it, and it helps us to I guess you know see what you what what people are wanting to know and connect that to um, experts in the industry such as Jeff so um, a recording will be available at the end of this webinar for anyone that's missed it or if you want to watch it again and we pop it up on our Facebook page so I'm going to do some poll questions and these poll questions just help us, well, firstly, it helps us know where you're listening in from, but it also helps Jeff know, I guess, um, you know, what to, a bit of a direction for the webinar. So I'll launch some questions. And the first question is, what is your involvement in the cattle industry? Is it any of those um, options? So I'll just give participants a couple of seconds to fill that in. And five, four, three, two, one. And I'll close that one. So today we've got 93% um, of cattle producers with some in the government roles and some in non-government roles. So that's a really good spread. Um, thanks for taking the time to listen in. So I'll do the next one. So 
So the next one is, where are you listening in from? It's always interesting when we have these webinars where people are listening in from. So five, four, three, two, one. I'll share that one. So, yep, yeah, we've got a fair few producers from our region in the northwest, but a couple um, outside of New South Wales, even, and, and in other regions. So that's great. So there's just a couple. There's a couple more. Bear with me. Um, so one that will help, I guess, Jeff in his presentation, and it's really interesting for us to know is is what impact has the drought had on your breeder numbers? to be joined this year. For, so for those producers to pop that in. And five, four, three, two, one. Let's close that one. So we've had a couple with no change to their um, numbers and a 60, a fair percentage that have had a 30% or more reduction. So there's, there's just three more to go. So the next one is, did you join heifers in 2019? And five, four, three, two, one. I'll close that. So we have 68% said they did and 32% said they didn't. Now, the next question is, will you be joining heifers in 2020 or have you already? And five, four, three, Two, one, close that one. So a fair percent of the audience um, says they have or will, and a couple haven't and won't. So last one, um, get it up. This is always interesting. What time of the year do you carve? And five, four, three, two, one. Who's that? Share it. There we go. So, all reasonably even split between spring and winter carving systems and a couple of autumn carving systems. So, that's it for the polls. Um, I'll now introduce Jeff. So if my slide would go to the next slide. Um, Jeff, we firstly thank you for being on this webinar and being able to talk tonight because we really appreciate it. But Jeff is the director of Jeff House Livestock and it was established in 2014 as a private consulting business with the aim of sharing knowledge with beef producers and the beef supply chain across Australia. Jeff works closely with beef producers, lot feeders and processors to improve the performance of their herds and operations. Activities include on-farm animal selection, feedlot feedback trials and carcass judging, all with the aim of providing feedback to producers on the performance of their animals along the supply chain. After graduating from the University of Sydney in 1994 with a Bachelor of Science in, in Agriculture, Jeff was employed by the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries moving to Forbes as the Livestock Extension Officer in Beef in 1997 and remained in this position until 2013. Since 2014, Jeff has been contracted by the Australian Lot Feeders Association as their Technical Services Officer. This role delivers information, education, training and technical services to improve management practices among cattle lot feeders throughout Australia. Jeff has worked closely with the local land services, delivering training and workshops regarding to drought management, confinement feeding and drought decision making, 
So we really look forward to listening to Jeff tonight. So I'll hand over to Jeff and yeah. Great, thanks Kate for the introduction. I'll just load my screen up and we'll get underway. So hopefully there, Kate, can you see my screen now? Uh, yep, I can see your screen. Oh, great. And I, I'll just mute myself now, Jeff. Awesome. Great. So yeah, welcome everyone uh, this evening and, and thank you for joining us. And um, yeah, big thank you to the uh, local land services uh, for the invitation to um, to present tonight. It's it's great to be um, be sitting here with, with a much better season around us now. I, I must admit I haven't done a lot of travelling around in the last few months, but uh, I've managed to get out in the last week or so. And yeah, it's it's great to see you know, a lot of producers having a really good autumn and look, in a lot of cases, potentially the best autumn um, that a lot of producers can remember. So yeah, it's great that we're in that situation. There's still pockets that are that are doing it quite tough and, and haven't come out. And there's, there's pockets in Queensland that are still still quite ordinary, but um, you know, it's, it's a lot better situation than what we're in uh, 12 months ago. So that's really the focus of tonight's presentation is to take away a little bit of what we've learned from those last couple of years, but then also going forward and how we might try and capitalise on on uh, what what has sort of happened and and where we're at now and where the season's at. So what I want to um, to talk about tonight, again, a little bit of a recap on confinement feeding. Uh, we did some workshops with the LLS last year uh, around setting up confinement feeding areas and visited a number of sites. And so yeah, just some of the lessons that, that people have learnt from those. Some of the tools that are available to beef producers in, to, to help them maintain uh, production in their herds, um, regardless of the season. And then also uh, a little bit around opportunities to rebuild herd numbers and, and, and move forward. And it's really interesting, and I thank everyone for, for replying to those questions, because um, I think that's, that's what I've experienced as I've spoken to people around. There is a lot of variation um, in where people are at in terms of their breeder numbers, um, how much they've had to destock. Uh, in the last number of years, and and you know the the 62 percent of people um, you know that are 30 percent or or more down in their um, in their herd numbers, breeder numbers, uh, yeah, that's that's something that we, we need to sort of talk about and and try and work out how we might um, we might try and rebuild from there. So we'll head on in and start some of the confinement feeding um, lessons that that we've learned. Well, I suppose I'll, I'll start with you know, what is confinement feeding? Um, I'd imagine most people that are on the um, on the webinar tonight are well and truly aware of, of what it was. But yeah, you know, we, we talk about confinement feeding. It's really where we're trying to, to keep stock in a small area, um, usually at the stage where we're full hand feeding. So you know we're supplying all their, their nutrients, we're feeding them fully, and we're trying to confine them in a much smaller area with the real aims of trying to limit the extent of pasture and soil degradation. So we're really, one of the key aims is to try and limit that damage that happens to our, our pastures and our soils. It allows us to keep a close eye on the stock. We don't have animals walking the paddock, um, trying to find feed or water. And this is ex exceptionally important after the, the rain has come, and, and we'll touch on that in a moment. And it's also got the benefit of, of trying to reduce the spread of weed seeds. Um, you know, a lot of people I spoke to were in the situation last year where they, they were having to buy in, you know, if not all the feed, a, a large percentage of the, the feed they were they were feeding out. And you know, there's always that risk there of introducing weed seeds, whether it's in grain or whether it's in roughage um, onto your property. By confining those animals in a smaller area, hopefully we, we reduce the spread of those things. And again, that's something we need to look out for uh, as we move forward. But really, in my mind, the really big part of confinement feeding is really to make, it, it's designed to maintain our herd production. So it's really around maintaining 
growth in young stock and fertility in our females. They're really key points. I, I don't talk about confinement feeding uh, from a beef herd perspective um, ever in the sense of survival feeding. Um, we're always feeding our, our beef cattle to maintain production. Uh, we can't afford to feed them for survival. Um, we need to maintain our production. And that's probably one of the, the things that's really come out of the lessons that we'll, we'll talk about in a moment. I suppose some of my observations as we went around, they probably tended to be, um, when we talk about confinement feeding areas, um, we can be either talking a, a pen type structure or a small paddock. And I suppose my observations were that there were more sheep fed in, in pen type setups and we tended to see more cattle fed in small paddocks. Now, that doesn't mean that it didn't, didn't happen uh, the other way around. That was just observations that I, I made as I was, was sort of traveling around a little bit. Um, there were plenty of cattle fed in pens, but as a general rule, that seemed to be the way that it, um, it seemed to pan out. Now, what, what are some of the lessons that we, we've sort of taken away from from feeding cattle in confinement areas. One of the ones that um, I spoke about when we were doing a lot of the workshops and it, it came true, you know, again, it was born out this time. Um, droughts are broken by rainfall, which is just a really good thing, but it means that our feeding areas need to have all weather access. So there were, I, I didn't hear of too many, I, I know of a couple of, situations where people got into a little bit of a bind um, when it did rain and and getting to feed troughs, for example, they might have been able to get down to the, uh, the confinement feeding area, but had a few issues with actually getting feed uh, in the troughs or in the pens um, because of the weather. But, you know, majority of cases, that was something that people were really mindful of and it, it worked out really well that you know, we do need to feed for a period of time um, after it's rained and we might have some, some wet and muddy conditions there. Probably on the positive side this time round, with the rain coming when it did in, in February in a lot of cases, um, we actually had a really rapid response from our, our pastures and, and sown crops, early sown forage crops got away really quick, the soil was still warm and so that period of having to, to access our, our confinement feeding areas after it had rained, in a lot of cases was quite short this time around. So that alleviated some of the issues um, in past droughts. We've had situations where it's been a bit, the weather's been a bit cooler when the, the drought's finally broken and we, we've actually had a much more extended period of time where we've had to deal with wet weather um, while the pastures have got away and the feed base has got back away from us. So, this time that happened very quickly because of when the rain fell, um, which was a real advantage. Uh, can't stress enough, quality clean water. Uh, the number of people I spoke to just, just kept reiterating this. If, if they didn't clean their water troughs often enough, um, if there was any problem with water at all, then that really did have a negative impact on, on the animal's performance. And young stock that you're, you're trying to keep going and keep going forward, um, really had to have that clean water. So cleaning water troughs regularly. Um, lanch on the sheep side, it was was probably even a, a, a higher level of importance, especially with lambs. Um, even a film of dust on the top of the water was enough to, to cause some issues with lambs. Uh, cattle not so sensitive to, to just a little bit of dust on the, on the top there, but still during hot weather, um, we still wanna be cleaning the water troughs, you know, at least a few times a week. Um, and in some instances, people were even doing it daily if they were getting a uh, fair amount of feed contamination going into those water troughs. So we need to keep on top of that. Some of the really big pluses from people that, that fed cattle in, um, in confinement areas, there was a real positive that they were able to control the nutrition of the animals. And by having them in that confined area and under close observation, it meant that they were able to monitor the animals really well. So if they were, um, they felt the animals were, were sort of, you know, picking up a bit too much in condition, then there was the option there to, to drop the feed back a little bit. Or, you know, if animals were slipping, then they could actually pick that feed level up really quickly, really easily, 
and they were able to monitor that really well, how the animals were consuming, uh, the amounts the animals were eating. And so that made that ability to control the nutrition really, really good. And also the management of those animals in there. I put the comment in there, wean early and often. I suppose, again, before the, we, we learn a lot in these, these times, um, one of the slides I was presenting at a lot of the workshops was, you know, in terms of weaning, we talk about weaning animals down to about 100 kilos um, or 100 days um, of age as a, a sort of minimum age and weight to wean at. Look, there were plenty of people that weaned uh, cattle much lighter than that. Um, I heard of people weaning potentially down to 60 kilos. And there was also the comment there around weaning often. Um, if you had a spread out uh, joining, and a spread out calving, then you know the, one of the real positives of it was was for people not to be afraid to go in and wean those early calves, take a, a lick of calves off, um, even potentially while calving was still happening with with some of the later calvers. So get in there, take those calves off early. They needed to be fed really high quality, really good pro, high protein feed, but because of their small size and their small weight there wasn't a huge amount of it that they needed to be fed. So, you know, even a hundred kilo animal, um, its potential intake for a calf is, is really probably only going to be around three kilos a day. So there's small amounts of, of a really high quality feed that needs to be fed. And, you know, when we're weaning those animals early like that, we really do need to become their mum and, and really look after them and keep them going forward. And, there's a lot of those cattle around now that were fed like that and, you know, have grown really, really well. They haven't suffered any setback and, you know, they're going to go on and, and be really productive animals as opposed to if, if they had been left on their mums and not fed um, or their mums hadn't been fed properly. So by weaning early like that, we, do, we reduce the amount of feed overall we need. We also reduce the amount of really high quality feed we need. So it just makes our, our allocation of feed a lot easier and, and it makes the whole process uh, run a, a lot smoother. Challenges with, with feeding those calves, yes, we, we need to keep a really close eye on them. We don't want the groups to get too big. Again, feedback, uh, a lot of people suggest, you know, if you can keep them in groups of under about 50, um, that works really well. So better to have a number of yards with, with smaller numbers in them than really having great big groups of those early weaned calves running together. Another big positive of the um, confinement feeding areas, people were able to actually maintain tight joining. So there are a lot of people that joined uh, in these confinement feeding areas and you know got really good high conception rates, which which is fantastic. That's Really one of my, my key emphasis is, is around maintaining production and being able to join on time, get high conception rates is absolutely critical to maintaining production. So um, that was a really positive outcome. And, you know, the, they're the calves that are, that are sort of you know, on the ground now um, for a lot of these people. So, or, you know, about to hit the ground. So, you know, they're the next crop of income for, for those herds. Some of the other um, things that we saw this time around as well, there was there was a real marketing advantage with young cattle um, for people that that fed those those light cattle in the confinement feeding areas and and kept them moving forward. So we really did see uh, quite a strong price differential between light weaner type cattle and cattle that were you know a bit heavier um, in some of the feedlots. You know, we're buying cattle down to sort of 250 kilos. Um, definitely by 300 kilos, you, you had a beast there that was really ready to go into the feedlot and move forward. And there was quite a significant price increase uh, for those feeder cattle right through the dry time. So I think we can't underestimate um, the impact that the feedlot industry has had on the, the Australian beef industry, uh, especially in these times of drought. Cattle were worth money the entire way through. Um, they really there weren't a lot of animals, you know, if an animal was in good condition 
and it had been maintained and, and well fed, that it was worth money. Now that was, you know, for those younger animals that was going on to feed into feedlots. And there was also a really strong demand for meat uh, on a global scale. So even our, our cull females were really worth, worth really good money. So from a welfare point of view, maintaining those animals and keeping them in good condition, um, you know, while being what we really need to do from a welfare point of view, it also made really good economic sense because those animals were worth uh, good, good prices and good money. The next point there, better able to manage cattle on a green feed. Um, I, I still think this is one of the big advantages of confinement feeding as well, is it allows you to manage those cattle back out onto feed. And there's an old adage that you hear around the traps um, that you know, often more cattle die after a, a break to a drought than what actually died during the drought. And it's about trying to get them back onto feed and manage that process, which at times can be quite difficult. So by having animals confined, it allowed producers to actually manage that process and, and put cattle out onto feed for, for short periods of time, reintroduce them to, to green feed, um, while also still being able to, to maintain intake in the confinement feeding area. It's one of the challenges, if, if cattle are out in larger paddocks, uh, once it rains and we get a little bit of a green pick start to come through, um, those cows will, will chase that green feed. Young cattle will get a little bit out of it, but you know, our, our mature cows really struggle to, to get feed, but they, they'll often turn their nose up at what we're trying to feed them as a supplement or as even a full hand fed ration in lieu of chasing that green feed. So we, we can run into a lot of problems at that time if we don't confine the cattle. And again, that was the feedback that by having them in confinement areas, it really did allow that management back on the green feed to happen, happen quite, quite effectively. Um, which again is a really good thing. Again, this time around, because of the rain and the timing, um, you know, our feed did bounce away really quickly. So even that managing them back onto feed was, was a relatively quick process, but it was still able to be done more efficiently from, from out of confinement feeding areas. Last couple of comments um, from, you know, in terms of feedback. A number of producers made the comment and you know it, it was expensive to feed but it also allowed them to maintain cash flow so they had stock that were saleable they were able to um, you know get those animals onto the market and actually make a return off that and given the prices that we we experienced and we at the time you know, feeding was was quite economical on a lot of those animals. Those extra kilos that were able to be put on um, could be done at a, at a rate that um, that actually made a profit. So there was incentive there to to feed those animals and, and keep them going forward. And look, and I come back to that that point. You know, we really need to maintain production in our herds. That's that's the big part of of a cattle herd. Is when we get into a drought situation. We need to be able to maintain that production and, and really that's that's around fertility. We need to keep those females fertile and getting back into calf. And look, really, this, this slide that I've got here now, this is something I, I put together a number of years ago um, when we were running ProGraze courses when I was with the department. And it was just to demonstrate how in a beef herd situation, if we're joining heifers and look, you know, the month of the year is not, not so important, it's just the, the process as we go along. But if we're a herd that calves in, starts to carve in August, um, you know, we're gonna start our joining in November this year. So if we've got a heifer that's moving forward and we're gonna join her for the first time in, in November this year, she'll be pregnant for the first nine months, she'll carve down in August next year, hopefully, um, we'll then, look to rejoin her in November. Um, so there's a, you know, a short window there where she's lactating before joining. She's then, we're hoping to get her back into calf. So then she experienced a period where she's, she's pregnant and lactating up until, depending on, on weaning time, we'll talk about that a fair bit later on. Um, she's pregnant and lactating before we take that calf off. We take the calf off, 
and then she's got another pregnancy, you know, she's pregnant again, through to calving, period again where she's lactating and joining. So really for a productive female, once she gets in calf that first time, for the rest of her life, she really is, she's either pregnant, lactating or pregnant and lactating. So there's no real downtime in, in a female's life once they join our, our beef breeding herd. And of course, the point at the bottom there, which is, you know, it's stated in the obvious, but the only income we get from that female every year is the calf that she produces. So, you know, our, our females go in there, they're, they've, we've actually got quite a high demand on them going forward. There's not a lot of, of downtime in there. And we really, we, we rely on that calf um, as our income from her. So it, it really is a, a, a high level of production that we need to maintain. And that's what we're looking to do right through um, with our confinement feeding areas to, to allow us to maintain this. We, we don't want to see a break in, in this production cycle or it really has big impacts on the economics of our herds. Okay, moving forward. Last couple of points on, on confinement feeding areas. Um, what, what are we sort of doing with them now? Um, back to the, the point I made earlier about weeds and weed seeds. Um, really important that people get out there now and actually have a bit of a look around in the areas where they fed cattle in the confinement feeding areas. Just have a look around and see if there's any, any new weeds that, that might, have, um, might have appeared. Uh, or, or are there. I know driving around there's, there's some pretty impressive uh, weeds growing in a lot of these areas. Uh, they're quite nutrient rich so they do tend to, to generate a fair, um, a fair growth of weeds in there. But just be really mindful if there's anything new in there that you haven't seen before. If you're not sure what it is, you know, by all means you know, pull a plan out and, and take it in and, and talk to your the local land services staff just see if you can get it identified because the last thing we want to do is, is come out of a drought and actually have in, weeds introduced in the new areas and let them get a bit of a stranglehold. So they'll be really mindful of those, have a good look around and, and make sure there's nothing there. And then, you know, in these, these better years, um, if you, you've gone to the expense of, of building a confinement feeding area, especially if you've built pens, you know, some of the things we can use them for in these non-drought years, something like yard weaning. So if you've built a confinement feeding area, you've put um, bunks in there, for example, you've built it as a yard, you know, that's an ideal area to, to yard wean your calves. And look, I can't stress how important that is, um, not only for animals that, that potentially end up in the feedlot, but even for your replacement heifers and, and the females in your herd, just, that settling down process that happens with yard weaning. It's a great time to educate animals. They're really amenable to training at that time. Um, so we can we can educate them to our yards and the, and the whole process and handling. So there's a lot of benefits to that. We can use them as quarantine areas. So if we do buy in new stock, um, if we can keep them in those areas for a period. So again, any weeds, anything that's been introduced to the property, um, if there's any illness in those animals, we can actually keep them separate and just keep them quarantined for a period of time once they arrive on our property. And you know those confinement areas are fantastic for, for use there. And unfortunately, we saw this a bit around the state earlier in the year um, with the bushfires that were happening. That, you know Some of these areas ended up having to be used as emergency feeding areas when fires struck properties and they found themselves in a, in a position where they had to full hand feed. You know, some of the areas in southern New South Wales that actually got a bit of rain earlier on and, and had some a big body of feed, you know, then found themselves being burnt out. So you know, these confinement feeding areas then can swing in and, and be used as emergency feeding areas quite easily when they're set up. So think about these areas. If you've invested some money in in putting them together and in troughing. Um, you know, those people that have gone out and bought, especially bought concrete troughing for cattle, um, you know, let's make sure we utilise those areas, um, even in the good seasons and, and make make some use of them so that we can, um, you know, average those costs out a bit more and, and 
have those areas in, in a condition so that we can use them if we need them. Now, I suppose I just want to move forward now and sort of talk to you a little bit about, you know, where to now. Um, we've sort of had a, a bit of a look back on on the confinement air feeding areas and some of the stuff we've we've heard. But where are we going to go to now? What what can we do now to continue to maintain our production? And some of the challenges we've got, most most producers, I would imagine, have got a, a reasonable amount of feed in front of them now. So so animals are doing quite well. But often as we come out of these these droughts, um, our herd structure can be all over the shop depending on how people reduce numbers, whether it was older animals taken out, whether it was a percentage across all age groups, um, whether it was heifer, and the reason I asked the heifer questions um, there at the start too was, you know, often in droughts we see um, people elect not to maintain or not to retain heifers and grow them out. So, and we saw that in the, the kill figures last year, you know, the percentage of females um, that were being slaughtered was, was exceptionally high. So a lot of females, a lot of heifers, a lot of cows went to slaughter. Um, and I saw that in the work that I do with the feedlot industry, the number of you know, lines of really good heifers that were, were in feedlots um, that have been sold and were, were being fed and then went to slaughter uh, was, was, you know, was unbelievable. So depending on how um, you, you've managed to reduce your numbers, your herd structure is likely to be a bit out of whack and, and you know, not not what it what it normally should be, but also coming out of drought, we we often see um, a bigger variation than we, we might normally in in sort of the weight and the condition of our animals. There's always those ones that you know, no matter how hard you try with feeding, there's always those animals that are that are higher up in the pecking order get in there, get a little bit more than what what you probably intend for them, and there's some of those animals that that probably got a little bit less. So. We need to just be really mindful now of the weight and the condition of our animals. They're on good feed now, they're going forward, um, but there's probably a little bit more variation in there that may impact when we, we move forward into our joining. So we just need to be really a, a bit observant there. Um, if there are animals that, are, that have slipped behind and you know we can preferentially treat them, um, that's that's likely to be well worth it um, as we come up to our to our next joining. So we, we need to just keep an eye on those animals and we, we don't need pretty herds, they don't have to all look pretty. Um, and sometimes you can get some, some interesting looking beasts come out of the other side of a drought, but they do need to be productive. And that's, that's what we're really interested in, is making sure those animals remain productive. So what are some of the tools that we, we've potentially got out there to maintain this production and, and productivity in our herds. And I sort of listed a few there. Um, I, I don't really have time to cover all of them off tonight, but um, managing the feed base, you know, that that without a doubt um, is the, the absolute number one. Uh, in some cases, that's gonna mean that there's a bit of work to be done in, in re-establishing pastures and, you know, there's a lot of grazing crops out there at the moment that are providing a, a huge amount of feed for our animals. But, you know, as you drive around, some of the pasture paddocks have probably been a bit slower to, to recover and, and to take off. And, and there's probably big areas of the state where there will actually need to be a, a quite a significant investment in pasture re-establishment. So, um, you know, we need to really look at getting, getting some good advice in that space. Um, I think, you know, for most of the guys in the Northwest, Someone like Bob, Bob Freebrand, you know, is a is a brilliant uh, pasture agronomist and, and a source of, of some really good information uh, in terms of getting that that feed base right. Joining calving time and joining length, we'll, we'll talk about those in a second, as well as pregnancy testing and weaning time. So they're they're the four that I will cover. Um, I always like to put crossbreeding in there as well. I think as a beef industry and especially the southern uh, beef industry we're doing ourselves an enormous um, injustice by moving to more and more straight breeding. I know there's some of the breeds that are doing exceptionally good jobs and there's a lot of marketing that's happening with, around some of those breeds, but there's enormous benefits to be had from crossbreeding, especially if we've got crossbred cows. 
and you know the, the production benefits are enormous there. So look, don't have really time to cover that tonight. That that probably you know, that could be a, a webinar in its own right around crossbreeding, but there's a lot of benefits we, we need to to make sure that we, we keep in mind there and um, we don't want to miss out on all of those. All right, again, I'm, I'm based in Forbes. It, it's a big sheep area as well. And you know, the lamb guys, I, I always look over the fence at the lamb guys at how magnificently well they they utilise hybrid vigour and crossbreeding. And I think as a beef industry, we're, we're actually going a little bit backwards in that sense at the moment. So we just need to, need to keep that in mind. But the things we are really going to talk about here in the next next little bit, um, joining calving time. Look, we really need to aim to carve when there's the highest chance of having feed. Now, again, that's not a, a new statement or or an outlandish statement, but the graph that I've, I've put there in front of you, again, this is something, um, this was generated out of grass feed um, a number of years ago, but it was some work that I, I was just looking at if we look there on the left hand side there, they're the megajoules of energy that are 550 kilo British cow needs per day. The bit down the bottom here, that's her maintenance requirements right through the year. So, you know, they run at about 70 uh, megajoules, give or take a little bit, um, is, is her maintenance requirement. For this particular individual, we've got her um, carving down on the 1st of August. So we actually have in here, um, there's a wedge, and there's some slight, just in the way it's being graphed, it, it looks a little bit out, but we've got a wedge of energy here required in the pink color, which is for pregnancy. And then the blue is our energy requirement for lactation. So as you can see, the blue line is, is when she calves down, this female and her real peak in feed requirement. So you know, our maintenance levels at about 70. We, at the peak, which is about six weeks after she's carved down, we've actually doubled our energy requirement for that female. It almost peaks at 140 megajoules per day. So, and it's, it's quite a rapid increase up to that peak. Um, and then, you know, it tails off as you know, with our British cows, you know, there is variation in milk production, um, but we seem to, we do see that real peak in, in lactation quite quickly as the calf's growing up and then it tailing off. And of course, the period there with those two arrows, that is actually, this is the period between when she calves down and when we join again. So that period leading up to joining is actually her period with her absolute highest requirements for the year. So we need to make sure that that period does align with our, our feed availability and our feed supply. And you know, there's, there's no right or wrong answer depending where you are as to exactly what is the best time to carve down. A lot of producers around my area uh, would fall into that, that winter carving time. Um, and they're often relying a fair bit on, on some uh, sown crops. So some forage crops in there, whether it's oats or, or um, more commonly now, it's it's often a, a dual purpose uh, or a wheat or a, a barley or something they can graze. So they're getting that bulk of feed from from a, that source um, to to supply that that requirement in there, and then um, hopefully having a, a spring uh, flush of, of pasture feed that they can then move those animals onto. So really, time of year um, for for calving really depends on on what, what is your best chance. Probably the, the most difficult time from, from personal experience for carving, you know, is, is that autumn period. Um, it's probably the most hit and miss. Um, and, you know, we're in probably the best autumn in living memory uh, at the moment, but unfortunately that they are pretty rare to get uh, autumns anywhere near as good as this. So it, it's really important that we try and line, line that up. A length of joining, and again, this this sort of advice hasn't changed much uh, for many years, but it's really we're aiming for a condensed carving. And we still, this is what we're really trying to do. We, you know, we don't want to join for too long. Ideally, our heifers for six weeks, our cows uh, potentially for nine, 
And we talk in those three week blocks, of course, because the, the cycle in our, our cattle is, is 21 days. So it's a, a three week cycle, but we want the bulk of those calves born in that first cycle. We want better than probably 65% uh, born in that first cycle, the first three weeks. Then in that next week cycle, we want to pick up another 20 odd percent. So we're better than 80% in that first six weeks. And then we're really just picking up the, the tail enders in that third cycle. And that's the type of, of pattern that we want with our calving. Uh, it gives us the best ability to, to have good big lines of cattle to market. And just due to the fact that those animals are on the ground for longer, we'll end up with heavier weaners. So a calf born on the first day of, of calving versus the last day of calving, you know, we're, we're talking nine weeks here, 60 odd days. Um, so, you know, potentially we could have a calf that's 60 plus kilos heavier if it's born on the first day of calving versus the last day of calving, um, just purely because of, of those extra days of growth. So the more condensed we can get that calving, um, the bigger lines we, we can sell in, in a single go. And that, again, from a marketing point of view, that's, that's really important. Frequency testing, I, I think this is critical. And, and when we get to the last slide and, and we're talking about some of the opportunities at the moment, I, I think pregnancy testing is, is absolutely essential. Um, generally, we talk about preg testing about five weeks after the end of joining. Might vary a little bit whether you're using somebody that, that uses ultrasound um, or, or whether it's um, manual, uh, is exactly what's the best time. So, so talk to, to whoever you, you may be looking to get that done for you. And look, really encourage people to estimate, try and get the age of the fetuses estimated so that you've got an idea of, of your calving spread. Some of that variation that we might see in those animals coming out of the drought, we might actually end up with bigger spread this year than what, um, what we'd hoped for. So you know, try and get an estimate um, once we get to that stage of, of pre-testing and see where those, those animals are up to. And then the last little section here uh, in this is, is talking about weaning time. And look, for me, um, weaning really is something that, that can vary quite considerably depending on the season. So it depends on feed availability, cow fat score, and the age and weight of the calf. Now we already mentioned around, you know, we used to talk 100 days, 100 kilos of calf weight as a minimum weaning. Uh, we've seen people do it much, much younger than that in the drought. But realistically, if we've got plenty of feed in front of those cows, and like many herds are at the moment, um, you know they're, they're understocked, so that they really don't have enough mouths to um, to utilise some of that feed. Then weaning a little bit later is not going to be detrimental to to your herd if those cows are staying in good condition. If they're in fat score three um, with a calf at foot and they're not slipping, then you know, weaning a little bit later is is definitely not going to be detrimental to those those herds. If we're in a tighter situation, and the graph down underneath, it's actually based on that same chart that I showed before. Um, there's just some slightly different colours there. In the original one, um, we we're weaning at uh, seven months of age. In this example, if we bring that back to five months, then we see, you know, we get back to that 70 megajoules of maintenance energy quite quickly after weaning. Um, if we wean at seven months, then we're back down there. If we don't wean till nine months, then you know, we're, we're actually starting to see a slight pickup in terms of energy requirements for that cow due to the pregnancy that she's carrying now. So um, you know, we don't get back down to that 70, that real maintenance level uh, that we do with the, the five month and, and the sort of seven month weaning. So it really depends on, on the conditions in front of you. Weaning is a tool, you know, it's one of our, our best tools that we've got to help us manage uh, this process in terms of what our, our cows are doing, as opposed to a sheep enterprise where, um, you know, there's, there's a distinction between we've, we've got an animal that's pregnant, we can wean the lamb, and then we've got a period before we join again. Uh, in our beef enterprise, we don't have that flexibility. So often to, manage the condition of our cows at joining, weaning is one of the tools that we've got to do that. So that's why we don't want to let those females slip 
back in condition too far. And, and we definitely don't want to see them below a fat score two before we're pulling those calves off. And if in doubt, we want to wean early. If we're not sure the cows are starting to slip, then we want to get in and we want to wean quickly. That's, that's a really important, important management factor for our females is to get in there and wean early if we're in any doubt. I want to just quickly touch on, just for the last sort of five minutes here, just touch on a couple of opportunities that we might have um, in terms of building our numbers back up and, and how we might go about it. One of the really big challenges for beef herds in terms of with reduced numbers is we've got a much lower DSE rating or we don't need anywhere near the feed. And we also have a, a big hole in terms of lost potential income. And that actually ends up being a really big cost to a beef herd um, at this stage as we're recovering from the drought. We've got the actual costs that we've incurred during the drought in terms of feeding and the like, but if our numbers remain low for an extended period of time, then we're actually missing out on a considerable amount of income. And that becomes the really big, it's an opportunity cost that we've really missed out on. If we're in a situation where you can convert some of that country and, and maybe get a couple of crops off there um, and to generate some income from cropping, uh, if we can generate some income from sheep, possibly. Uh, I think you know, sheep are in about the same same situation as cattle are at the moment in terms of very difficult to buy animals in um, and the prices are really high. But we really need to look at how we might be able to, to utilise some of that feed. And the first option I've got there is, is the opportunity to join more heifers. So I, I'm a really big proponent um, even in normal seasons, when we're not trying to build numbers up necessarily, uh, of really trying to join as many heifers as you, you possibly can. Um, we want to select those heifers based on, on, predominantly on fertility, but weight is going to be a bit of a factor there in terms of, of when they're going to start to cycle. So um, with plenty of feed around at the moment, I'd really be encouraging people to, to try and maintain as many heifers as they can join as many heifers as they can, then come in and preg test, um, join for a short period, six weeks at the most, come in, preg test, any of those, those heifers that didn't get into calf, well, then we need to sell them. They're, they're, they've got to come out. Um, if we've then still, you know, we've got big numbers of heifers there that got into calf, then ideally, if we've still got the feed around, then let's try and run those through, carve them down, and then select based on their ability to carve down. So any that have issues, any that need help carving, any that lose their calves, then we actually cull those animals out and we retain the ones that carved freely, had no issues. If we've still got plenty of heifers there and they've got through, and we, you know, we're really testing on their fertility, then we can start to look at the calf that they rear and how good a job they do on, on rearing their calf. And you know that's, if we can select in that sense, and often in, in seasons we can't afford to keep that many heifers due to feed availability, but hopefully going forward this year, we're, we're gonna have enough feed there that we can afford to, to keep a lot more of those heifers, join them and, and push them through and just see how they, they perform and really select them on, on weight and fertility. And that's what we're aiming to do. Again, it comes back to the idea, they don't need to be, you know, we, we're not trying to pick a herd of, of females that are necessarily the best looking and the most attractive females. We want the ones that get in calf early and, and rear us a good calf. So that's what we're looking to do. I put the, the next one there, buying females. Um, I know that's exceptionally difficult at the moment, just in availability, but you really need to do sit down and do your sums and you might be a little bit surprised that you can pay a bit more for females to get your numbers back up and to start to generate that income again from your herd quickly than what you might imagine. And, you know, in a lot of cases, it's quite possibly, you know, your best investment there is actually often um, young females, heifers. If you can buy heifers that are, that are getting close um, to being able to join and you can align them with your herd, 
then that money that you invest in those heifers, actually you have a number of returns from those animals through their life. So you can actually, that investment in those females is actually averaged out over a number of years. If we go and buy older cows or, or pregnancy tested in calf, then you know, we, we don't always have that ability to get them firstly in sync with our herds, but then also um, to, to actually get those, those number of, of calves out of those animals to justify the, the cost and the expense that we, we may need to outlay. So you know, sit down and do your sums, will vary greatly based from herd to herd, what animals you, you cut into during the drought, and you know, again, talk to your LLS staff. Um, there are some models around that, that can be used to, to look at some of that sort of stuff and some of those, those costs that are, that are involved. The next two that I've put there, I've put them in red because you know, I know it's, it's getting a little bit later in the evening, but I just only a few minutes ago was telling you about how important condensed carving was and, and carving at the right time of year. Both of these seem to contradict exactly what I was just saying, but I, I put them in there as opportunities for producers, but I do have one proviso in here. I don't mind if you want to leave the bulls in for a little bit longer this year. So you might leave them in for 12 weeks um, so that you, you're really maximising the number of females you're getting calf. But when you come to preg testing, then it's really important that you age, you, you have the fetuses aged, and any of those animals that have, have felt fallen pregnant in, in that later period, uh, beyond your sort of nine weeks, they really need to be identified and they need to be culled. So the opportunity really exists in that you've got animals that you could potentially sell as pregnancy tested in calf, but they shouldn't remain in your herd. Um, extending your joining time to, to try and build numbers up just causes more problems down the track. It's really hard to try and bring animals back and, and shorten that time back up. So I, I'm really firm believer in, you know, if you want to extend it out and you want to get a few more in calf, that's fine, but they have to be identified and they have to be identified as animals that are going to be sold and, and culled out of your herd. They may well fit in nicely with someone else's herd that has a later calving um, time, but they really shouldn't be in yours. And a little bit like out of season calving as well. I've heard of a number of people that you know, are traditionally spring carvers, that this year because the, the herds are a little bit mucked up, they're, they're having an autumn calving as well. And I don't see that as necessarily a problem in terms of trying to get more females in calf. And, and trying to, to maximise the value of those females, but it's not something that I'd be looking to do as a long-term management strategy. Um, I, if you were to join those animals for an out-of-season calving, I would again be looking to sell those animals as pregnancy tested in calf. And it's really just trying to, to capitalise on the demand that's, a, that's around for, for females to build up uh, numbers in herds, but I wouldn't suggest people start splitting their their numbers and, and splitting across two seasons with calving. One of the really important drivers of profitability in, in a beef herd is actually having scale and having, having the numbers to actually sell and generating those lines of cattle that, that we can you know, have more ability to, to market and attract buyers for. And if we start splitting our herd into due to calving at different times, then we reduce that ability and we end up with a lot of small lines and we can't really get the true value out of our cattle. And often we end up, rather than getting a calf from a, a female every 12 months, it's quite easy for that to slip out to every 18 months, which again, from a beef herd profitability is, is disastrous. So we want to keep it really tight within the, the designated calving time and any of those ones that get joined to do that really need to be um, identified and, and identified to be sold and, and culled out of the herd. And you know, that's the last point, the adding value to cull females. That's really what, what we're looking to do with those sort of animals is in a, in a more normal season when we're not coming out of drought, that might just mean feeding those animals um, once we identify them as culls, to get a bit more weight into them and get a bit more condition in them. 
uh, probably at the moment with a herd that's that's really looking at a real rebuild phase, then there's some value in actually having those animals pregnancy tested in calf. But again, I really stress that the value is not in, in keeping them in your herd, it's in being able to sell them as an animal that's um, pregnancy tested in calf and has that sort of value. So I'm still really, really strong on that idea. We want to condense calving and we want it at the time of year when we're going to most likely the, the best probability of having feed on the ground for those females to carve down onto. And look, that's that's me done, uh, Kate. So yeah, probably gone a little bit longer than I'd, I'd planned, but I hope uh, there's some some pieces of information in there that people can take home. And yeah, more than happy to uh, to take questions. That's fantastic. Thanks, Jeff. I certainly got a lot out of that, and I think the key messages there are managing our females and and you know looking at our um, joining windows and thinking about the nutrition re like requirements of our females and but one thing we probably there's an opportunity to touch on is our bulls like yes yes our females are our you know that's our pro production drivers but our bulls have a play a role too and at the moment what what should they be like what should producers be thinking about like how important is that rising plane of nutrition for our bulls Jeff and and you know making sure that they're at the top of their game as well. Yeah, look, absolutely, it's critically important. Um, the poor bulls in in a number of herds probably got a bit neglected during the drought and probably did it a little bit a little bit tough. They're their own worst enemy in terms of of how they they like to fight when we put them in in confined areas and do damage. But look, at the moment with the the feed that's out there now. Um, hopefully most of those bulls would, would be on a, on a really good rising plane of nutrition. And if you've got any doubts, um, you know, now is the time to get the vet out and, and to, to check the fertility of those bulls. We need to do it you know, a reasonable time before joining. Um, so ideally you want to be checking your bulls yeah, six weeks at the absolute minimum before joining. Um, because yeah, if there's any fertility issues, that need to be dealt with, then you know we need some time to deal with that. So we, we need them on a good plane of nutrition. Probably there might be the odd herd where where the potential for bulls to be maybe getting a little bit too good a condition. Um, you know we don't want them too fat. If they've got a good number of cows to go out with or heifers to go out with, I usually strip that fat off pretty quick once they go out. But um, yeah, there's something to to really think about and not just a few days before joining. We, we need to go out and check our bulls, you know, at least six weeks before. And, you know, potentially if there's any doubts uh, in terms of structure, so, you know, make them walk around. If there's any any lameness in amongst them or if if they, they look as though there might be some structural issues or if you're in any doubt with, with their fertility, uh, absolutely get the vet out, talk to the, the local land services um, about getting someone out to have a look at them in plenty of time. That's great. Thanks, Jeff. One other thing is that um, I suppose at the moment there are a lot of people relying on those dual purpose crops and, and with that we've it's popped up a little bit, but just looking for your opinion, like minerals, like sometimes do we underplay the value of minerals in, in their diet? And, you know, with with cattle, magnesium and calcium and, and salt, like providing those as a just an ad hoc to their out in the paddock as a leak or, or whatever, how important is that, Jeff? Yeah, look, I, I agree, absolutely, really important. Um, most of our grazing cereals are, are really low in calcium, um, so we do need to be really, really careful. And we've got a bit of bulk there now, so it's not not as as dangerous as a bit earlier on when they're when they're quite young and, and fresh. Um, you know, grass tetany, magnesium issues can definitely arise. So I, a really simple um, solution to that is just, yeah, having those loose licks out all the time. Um, it can be a, a, as simple as a one to one to one lime, cause mag and salt um, as, a, as a loose lick out in the paddock. Um, just look, that's as, we can make it as simple as that so that those animals are, are getting those Getting the calcium they need, getting the magnesium they need, uh, so that we try and avoid any any issues that might arise. 
No worries. Well, if there's there's no other questions, we might um, call it a call it a day or a night and um, say thank you, Jeff. Like I really appreciate you taking the time to have a chat to us tonight, and I hope everyone that's listened in has got some value out of tonight's webinar and can you know take those messages back. Um, yeah, so thank you and, and thanks everyone for listening in and um, yeah, we look forward to hearing from you next time. No worries, thank, thanks, thanks a lot, Kate. And again, yeah, thanks to, to all the listeners.